Thank you, Cam. Innovation. It's not some sort of out of reach, esoteric concept reserved for brainiacs or dot commers or techie hipsters. In fact, today, in a world that's changing dramatically, the role of innovation and the role that each one of us plays in shaping the future of our community is more relevant than ever. Now, since you all have probably had your recommended daily allowance of the word innovation, what I'm going to try to do is bring it down to earth, make it a little more relevant, a little more personal, and hopefully show you that every single one of us can innovate, whether it's in our jobs or our families or our community. So we're going to talk through some examples, uh, like little mini case studies, a little like... Uh, Sort of like business school, sort of. The examples are going to be kind of all over the map, very much on purpose. But I think you'll start to see some patterns, like the value of asking questions, of making connections, of engaging with people, of helping people to help themselves. And hopefully in the process, you'll get a sense that when it comes to innovation, you've already got what it takes. Because one, it can start pretty simply. Heck, it can even be an accident, like penicillin or Reese's peanut butter cups. Two, you're not limited to any particular subject, for-profit, non-profit, whatever. As an entrepreneur, an employee, a parent, a citizen, you can get all kinds of stuff done if, and this is a big if, if people have a sense of ownership, if they feel invested in a cause. And three, you don't need to wait on your neighbor or your boss or your government to do it for you. Like I said, you've got what it takes. And really, all you need to do to get started is to get started. So let's get started. Case number one. People always ask me about furniture, so I might as well start with this one. Believe it or not, I'm not really a furniture guy. Smart Furniture was born because I thought product design should be better connected to the people who use the product. We chose furniture because, at the time, I needed furniture. So I basically destroyed a professor's wood shop in designing a, a patented product that was a lot like Legos for adults that, that helps customers connect and design their own furniture without tools. That was pretty cool. Even better, though, we designed what probably was, back in 1999, maybe the first e-commerce-enabled design tool on the web. It helped people drag and drop and design furniture on the fly. It was pretty unique, and this all sounds pretty cool. We called it Design on Demand. but. But the question is, was this meaningful innovation? Did this matter? The answer is yeah. Yeah, it was. It was meaningful enough, though, that nearly every competitor in the industry replicated what we did over the next decade in different ways. No doubt, consumers benefited, and smart furniture likely changed the industry. But we didn't have the resources to, to capitalize on the opportunity. Also, our innovation was probably 10 years too early. It took a decade for the market to come to expect what we had to offer. Now, this is not an uncommon problem. Ask Bill Gates about his tablet computer. And yeah, we powered through, and we found our mojo again, but it was not easy. But I share it, because it's real. Speaking of real, this reminds me of what might have been one of the better slides I ever had in a presentation. And by the way, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a, a PowerPoint for you. I, I preferred to have you like, scrutinize every flaw in my face on two giant screens. <laughs> um, so anyway, I was pre presenting to like a giant herd of venture capitalists. And uh, while all the other companies were kind of presenting their $100 million you know, revenue hockey stick templates, uh, our slide had at the top Here's everything we screwed up. 
We actually got funded from that presentation. And I mention it because if you want support for your innovation, it helps to, to level with people and level with yourself right out of the gates. It also helps to follow a slide that, <laughs> like that with uh, a slide that basically says, and here's how we fixed it. Case number two. A woman named Maria walks into a Starbucks in Sweden and applies for a job. She loves coffee, really loves coffee, and she knows her stuff. But she doesn't get hired because of the color of her hair. It was too blue. So here's the question, pretty much a, a softball. Was that a good idea? Should they have based their hiring decision on the color of someone's whatever? Short answer, nope. Long answer, big mistake. Maria Delacroix walked out of that Starbucks and went on to found a company called Wheelies. Built a network of more than 500 freaking ingenious full service cafes on wheels. And it's become the fastest growing franchise in history with growth surpassing, you guessed it, Starbucks. And guess where they, uh, they set up their first cafe? Out in front of the same Starbucks that had rejected Maria. You could call this an edge case of helping someone to help themselves. Clearly it was unintentional, and Maria certainly did help herself. But she didn't stop there. She focused on the connections. Wheelie's cafes are all connected in a network that allows Wheelie's founders to share knowledge and intel on a daily basis, on a global basis, and it's become a competitive advantage. And it's also become a network that extends, believe it or not, now to Chattanooga, Tennessee, where a group of entrepreneurs are just now, as we speak, setting up a Wheelie's cafe. Keep an eye out for them. Case number three, speaking of connections. When I first moved to Chattanooga, there was really no support network for startups. There really weren't any startups either. We were kind of a ragtag bunch. What there was was palpable potential in a community that had shown, like a startup, that it could align itself quickly to get stuff done. And so one reason I moved back here was I wanted to help this place cultivate a startup ecosystem. So the question was, at the time, what is a startup ecosystem? I mean, were there common needs of innovative companies that some sort of organized effort could help, help foster, a front door, a hub of connectivity? Answer, turns out, yeah. And thanks to a group of entrepreneurs and civic leaders with names like Grizzle, Morgan, Brock, Blitz, ultimately Bradshaw, Hitchcock, Hayes, Alling, and the Access guys, and others, whose early efforts like Innovate Here and Colab started gaining momentum. Built on principles battle-tested in places like Create Here, these efforts connected people with resources and with each, each other, equipping folks with tools and resources that helped them ultimately build what amounted to a fertile entrepreneurial ecosystem and a fertile innovation ecosystem. A lot of folks were willing to be pioneers in that effort. And you could argue that Main Street was the original innovation district. Over time, the list of companies who were part of this is, is impressive. Branch, Collider, Agla, Feats, Variable, Roots Rated, Delegator, Squid, Life Wrap, uh, CPR Life Wrap, South Tree, Collider, Crash Pad, Flying Squirrel, Bell Hops, ACT, Hot Chocolatier. Mm, mm, mm. I could go on. In fact, somebody asked me the other day about 3D printing in Chattanooga, and I was able to just rattle off five or six companies that were Silicon Valley caliber, and all of them started here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Even better, though, is how the, eco the ecosystem is starting to pollinate with new anchor tenants in the marketplace, like Lamp Post and Dynamo, the Chattanooga Renaissance and Jump Funds, the Chambers Incubator, the Enterprise Center, Launch, UTC, and the Edney 
in, yes, the new innovation district. And by the way, the fact that I can include the chamber and its incubator in this list is no small thing. Chattanooga's chamber is uniquely, very much, in the game. And they, in this community, deserve some real credit for that. And the best, I'm pretty positive, is yet to come. Case number four, innovation is not all for profit. 25 years ago, our city, still in the wake of the proverbial Cronkite moment, began coming together to rebuild itself. Through initiatives like Chattanooga Venture, Vision 2000, CNE, and River City Company, creating, among other things, what we call the Chattanooga Way. Now, that way of doing things essentially connects people and brings them together around common goals. It was a prominent part of Create Here and of a project called STAND, which enlisted hundreds of volunteers to canvas more than 25,000 Chattanoogans for their opinions on their community. That project ultimately became the largest urban visioning effort in history. But the question is, was that enough? Short answer, no. Long answer, it was incomplete. After stand, what we still needed was essentially deliver. There was an implementation gap, and it took some time and a fresh crop of entrepreneurs to fill it. Long story short, asking those questions helped lay the context for organizations like Causeway, Glass Street, the Un Foundation, and others to emerge. And in going door to door, two things stood out. Things that people repeated to me when I talked to them. One, no one's ever asked me my opinion about my community. These folks had never been engaged. And two, yeah, I want to help. I just don't know where to start. I don't know where to connect. Are you starting to see a pattern here? There's something about asking questions, connecting people, helping people to help themselves. I'd argue that if you want a healthy community, a healthy city, a healthy democracy, that people need a sense of ownership. And for that, they need to feel and be engaged and invested. Other organizations like Green Spaces, Arts Build, the Metro Ideas Project, Chattanooga Connected, and the Regional Thrive Initiative, they're all empowering folks to innovate for the good of their communities, block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, and the effects are compounding. Causeway is another good example of how to do this, a group of civic entrepreneurs supporting civic entrepreneurship, all based on the simple notion that where there's a cause, there's a way, all based, in other words, on the fact that they believe that anyone in any neighborhood who sees an opportunity for change can have access to the tools and resources to make that happen. They've helped Chattanoogans launch a community garden in Hill City, a healthcare clinic in Highland Park, a school technology project in East Brainerd, a block leadership program in Avondale, and a whole slew of upcoming projects to help tackle youth violence. And on November 21st, they'll be welcoming all Chattanoogans from all walks of life to one table for Thanksgiving. Join us. Case number five. This one's a little different. Call it the CF Smackdown. My wife Karen and I, we waited a long time to become parents. Like anyone, we were, we were excited. We were a little scared. Like many of you, the day we met our baby girl, Lily, was a day we learned that life is not all about us and a day we'll remember forever. But about a week in, we got some news, some test results that weren't normal. And then more tests, more news, until we were told that our daughter had a form of cystic fibrosis, or CF. CF is a traditionally incurable and pretty cruel disease. As parents of Lily, when we heard the news, at least for that moment, 
the future went kind of dark. As any parent can understand, suddenly we didn't care about anything except helping our, our daughter. But we didn't know where to start. We were lost. I was lost. There are parents in much worse situations than ours, but I confess, I personally entered dark places in my mind I didn't know existed. Places of dread, of helplessness. I thought about not saying this, but it's true. Sometimes I would look down at my baby girl in her crib, <clears throat> and I would see in my mind a little girl in a coffin. So a question, what do you do in a situation like this? when the sum of all human wisdom tells you you can't do anything? Answer, it's complicated. I can only tell you what we did in case it helps. The most important thing in the beginning was just to do something. Just get moving. As you might expect, we met with doctors. I read everything there is to know on CF, which has got its, its pitfalls but it did equip me and prepare me in ways that you'll see paid off later. Next, we connected with families in town, some of whom I will forever hold dear, some for just holding our hands. But all the while, and this may sound contrived or cheesy, but even when we felt like we were slipping into the darkness, I think it was the entrepreneur in me that helped me find some footing. Because in the midst of all of this, behind, beyond the doctors, beyond the families, behind the scenes, we launched a plan to connect with the researchers. And this is where things got interesting. Long story short, through every scrappy trick in the book, we found two research teams who believed, we believed, if connected with each other, might actually be able to do something here. One at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, one at UAB. Now, when I first contacted the one in Israel, her response was essentially, who the hell are you? To that, I employed what I started to call the Batman strategy, which uh, essentially, I didn't appear often, I didn't say much, but what I did, I knew what I was doing, and when I spoke, I knew what I was talking about. I chose my targets carefully, and as a layperson, I used whatever leverage I could, for example, that her team had always wanted to work with a team at UAB. Well, it worked. She was interested, and the doctor at UAB was looking for his next project. To their great credit, within a week, a week of our first meeting, these two teams had set up a plan, met with the CF Foundation, and soon we had a funded project underway. Now, four years in, Lily's doing well. The funding's just been renewed. They've started a company to work on this. And we've taken the chances for a breakthrough from probably one in a million to maybe one in three in climbing. <laughs> Better yet, in bigger picture, the innovation we're going after here addresses a problem that's a little bit higher up the flow chart than even CF, meaning if we have an impact here, if we're successful, there'll be positive implications for diseases like muscular dystrophy, spinal muscular atrophy, and more. Here's a takeaway. While this may seem like an outlier case of innovation, it's not really. If you're a parent in a situation like this, it may take it may take some scrappy stuff, but there is hope. There's always hope. And you know what? If you're a parent, you're, even if you're not in a situation like this, if you're a parent, you're always in some sort of situation. <laughs> so, in my view, you innovate every freaking day. <laughs> which leads me to case number six, which is more like a short commercial break since you probably, probably need it. This is basically a public service type announcement I'd love to, I'd love to create if I, had the, if I had the money. Picture a woman with cat-like reflexes. 
superhuman strength, saving people from danger, working tirelessly for others every single day, with often no sleep and little recognition. A kid approaches her on the street and asks, ma'am, are you a superhero or something? And she turns to him and says, yes, I'm a mom. Where's mama? There you are. Moms, dads, uh, I just want to tell you, don't ever think that you can't innovate. You, you do it every day. Case number seven. It's not just moms and dads, though. The same goes for other jobs. Teaching, for example. If you're a teacher, you're an entrepreneur. I taught for two years in another country, and it was probably the most entrepreneurial thing I ever did. But my ideas were often lost in the melee or locked in my classroom. And here's the thing, I don't think I was unique. So here's the question. With a $300 million budget and an army of talented teachers and principals, you think we might have some unlocked potential in our education system? Answer, yeah. And yeah, that was a, a softball. Take Carrie Randolph, for example, and her idea, Teacherpreneur. Teacherpreneur connects educators, communities, and business people, and equips teachers with time, space, and support to launch big ideas. Are you seeing a theme here yet? Just to drive the point home, Carrie says it was modeled largely after CoLab's program and seeks to create an entrepreneurial ecosystem for teachers. As with CoLab and Causeway and others, Again, we've got a situation where we've got a lot of talented people who've got a lot of good ideas that only need resources or connections to get going. And as you might expect, the cross-pollinating is already happening all across the system, from the STEM school to Chattanooga 2.0 to the Step Up program, Chattanooga Basics, Red Bank's Forest Kindergarten, Chat State's Mechatronics program, UTC Solutions Scholars, and Chattanooga's own girls and soon boys leadership academy. Should it stop there? Of course not. How about a venture fund for education? How about more competition between schools based less on athletics and more on academics? Or how about this, the Spirit of Innovation Award for education next year? Case number eight, are there pitfalls to all this connectedness and innovation? Yes, there are. People can lose jobs. Innovation can make us lazy and forget things like math and spelling. And more seriously, we begin to get very vulnerable to the very real threats of network hacking and unsupervised application of artificial intelligence and machine learning. These are legit risks. And they're going to be issues, no doubt. But you've got to take risks. You know, I used to be a, a surfer. It's what kept me sane during law school. And it taught me, probably taught me more than law school. When you go surfing, you start by jumping in the water and paddling out into the waves. You battle it out with others in the whitewash on the inside, or you can try to press through the breakers to get to the outside, where if you're patient, you can actually choose the waves you want to ride. On the way out, though, while you're getting pounded, pounded by the waves, you have to keep your focus on the horizon. You know there are threats, dangers all around, some you can't even see, but you can't dwell on them. You've got to keep paddling, paddling forward toward that horizon. Very occasionally, you'll find a current or a channel, a natural flow of water that's going your direction, one that can give you a boost towards the outside where the big waves are. So here's the question. Should you take this chance to rest, to recover your strength? Answer, no. Not if you're interested in the big waves. When you find that channel, that current, you don't sit back and go with the flow. You let it 
You don't let it carry you. You paddle harder. Because you can go faster and farther than you ever could before. Yeah, you may occasionally find yourself sort of out there. Maybe a little lonely. But you'll go to where the big waves are. Where the big waves begin to rise and the ones you can catch and ride before anyone else. Which leads me to our final case. Case number nine. A place called Chattanooga. We've found a channel. We've been paddling hard a long time. And we found some currents flowing in the right direction. But here's the question. Are we where we want to be? My answer is no. And now is not the time to rest. Yeah, we've got major progress across the board, including a ton of things I haven't even had time to mention today. But there are cracks in our community. Divisions that, in my view, we've got to address. As bright as Chattanooga's potential is, if we pat ourselves on the back and rest on our laurels, instead of becoming the best mid-sized city in the world, in the nation, we stand the risk of just becoming the most self-congratulatory. The current's flowing our way. Let's not just go with the flow. Let's not rest. We've got a chance now, now, to empower our community and our citizens to come together, to connect, to innovate, to help each other. Look, here's why we need this. Because some of these issues, crime, education, poverty, are so big and so difficult, and methods and technology are changing so fast that it's getting harder and harder for any one entity, government, foundations, siloed nonprofits, or anyone for that matter to pick winners alone. I've seen this play out. It is not necessary. Because our culture is one of coming together to get things done, of adapting to and capitalizing on transformation from the old to the new, of setting and achieving goals that sound ridiculous when they're first uttered. This is where all of this comes together. It's where all of us come together. As individuals, as organizations, like we said in the beginning, you can start simple. Reach across the table, across your desk, across the street, across your neighborhood, across the proverbial railroad tracks, and find and focus on the common ground we stand on, because it is there. And if you're a leader in the community, it's incumbent upon you to tap into the potential of each and every person who lives here. Our city is an entrepreneurial one. Chattanooga is, in so many ways, a startup. And our human capital is our most innovative, our greatest asset. So let's leverage that asset. Why can't we be the most engaged, the most connected, the most innovative city in the nation? We know how to do this. We know how to come together. We've been doing it for years. Let's do it again. Over the last few decades, we've built an amazing and innovative infrastructure of connected things, from the Riverwalk to the Smart Grid. Now, let's build an infrastructure of people, a culture of connection. Even if you're thinking, why bother? These problems, they never seem to go away. Here's why bother. First, and I bet every single one of us has seen this, when the citizens of a block, a neighborhood, a community start to come together and take ownership and invest, their time, their expertise, their resources, all or a lot of these other issues, crime, education, poverty, start to take care of themselves. And second, like every business person knows well, the burden and opportunity of innovation is on us. Nobody's going to do it for us. Not the government, not the foundations. Instead, like we said, every single one of us can and should innovate. We're all entrepreneurs. You're all entrepreneurs. And each of you has got what it takes to start something. 
So let's act like entrepreneurs, like owners, like innovators, and like Chattanooga is our business, because Chattanooga is our business. Let's all invest. Thank you.